Welcome to the ABCs of Horses, a big blend radio podcast featuring Christy Wood, a world champion horse trainer, a carded horse show judge, an equestrian expert, and an author. Hey, everybody, welcome to the very first episode of the ABCs of Horses. Uh, this podcast features Christy Wood, who has been on our show for over a decade, um, and it airs every Saturday, uh, excuse me, second Saturday on Big Blend Radio. So we're so excited because we've talked about horses and riding and trail rides with Christy. Um, and we've actually been on a horse under her tutelage. And um, it's <laughs> been amazing. It was an amazing experience. But all these conversations over the years has really led to let's do this monthly because uh, Christy, not only is she a world champion horse trainer, um, but she also works with students who are world champions. And together they are on her show team and they exhibit in jumping and in trail She's a winner in Extreme Trail Obstacle Challenges. She's a carded horse show judge with seven breed associations. And she is also an expert legal witness for equine court cases. Go get ya. Yeah, I mean, you don't mess with Christy. <laughs> <laughs> but she's also, she's also an author of three books. She's even working on her fourth. See, this is why we need to do this show. This is amazing how much work she's put into the world of the equestrian arts. Uh, she is the author of Your Best Horse Show, a guide for managers and exhibitors. The children's book, which I always say is also for adults, uh, Ranger, the little horse with a big heart. And her latest book is Hoofprints Across Time, A Trail Ride to Remember, which follows her adventures on the Chief Joseph Trail. And we will be definitely getting into that on next month's episode, where we're going to be talking about Appaloosa horses and uh, looking forward to that. But um, also where we met Christy, this was in the community of Three Rivers, right outside Sequoia National Park. And we met her at her Wood N Horse Training Stables. And that's WDNHorse.com. See why I slowed that down? We're in horse training stables. And that's where she teaches. Uh, she also goes out and does work over Zoom. Like I know that she works with people who are out purchasing a horse for the first time or want someone to have some expert um, eyes on what they're doing. And um, so she does it on Zoom. She travels out. But she also has people come in, especially beginner riders and advanced equestrians uh, working in English and Western disciplines as well as jumping and trail obstacle work. Whew, Christy, did I get that all right? <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Lisa. That introduction was perfect. Oh, well, hey, it's you're the one who did all the work. <laughs> you know, it's easy for me to sit and, and read it, um, but you did all that work. And what, you know, before we, we go further, and I want to tell people what we're going to be doing with the show and, um, and you know, talking about that, but... What was it? I mean, when did you first get on a horse? Do you remember? Do you have your first memory of, you know, getting on a horse? This is this is my thing, and then going, well, this is all I'm doing now. <laughs> this is my well, life. Like my first my first uh, mem uh, memory of being on a horse was when I was well five years old in um, a place called Fairy Stone Park in West Virginia just doing a, a little local trail ride and it kind of surprised me that I was that young and they put me on a horse and I was just beaming and smiling and they led me off on this really nice sort of a ponied trail ride, which means they led my horse. And, um, I gosh, it was just, uh, just exhilarating for me. And, um, but I, I purchased my first horse at, at the age of 13. I was, I was leading up to that pretty much all my life wanting to have a horse and my parents, uh, actually made a nice challenge out of it. And they said, you know, she's been bothering us and really wants a horse. Well, let's just see how dedicated she's going to be about this. And they said, if you can save up enough money to buy a horse and feed it for a year, then you can have one. And they thought that was going to be the end of the conversation. Well, I had no idea how competitive I was when they challenged <laughs> me, which is really wonderful because you have to be competitive in my world. And I did that. And I was able to go buy my first horse for $300. I borrowed $50 from my brother because the horse was $350. And I rode for for nine months bareback because I didn't have uh, a saddle. couldn't afford the saddle, but I didn't need one anyway. And just had a blast and just, just rode the, the foothills in the San Fernando Valley. And just everything blossomed from there. And, and then, of course, uh, I saw a horse show going on at the local stable where I rode with my friends. And that sort of drew me in and I thought, gee, look at the things they're doing with those horses. I would love to try that. 
But then mm-hmm. I didn't know I was doing at a horse show. I didn't know really what was involved with that. So my mother was found a lady, a trainer, to come out and because I didn't want to let everybody at the stable know what I was doing. I really wanted to have a, a, a private lesson with this lady. So she found a lady that came out to a vacant lot and gave me an hour's riding lesson on this is what they do at a horse show. This is what you have to do in response to what they ask you to do at a horse show. And it was just wonderful. And so the very next weekend, they were going to have a show at the stables. My mother borrowed uh, a pair of shaps, a Western hat. We borrowed uh, a fancier saddle. And she went out and bought me this beautiful Western shirt. And I went into my first horse show a week later after that one-hour riding lesson. And I came home with seven first places and high point for the day. I had found my niche. Wow. Like, I'm don't mess with Christy. So <laughs> co- yeah, competitive. By the way, we've been to that park, a fairy stone park in West Virginia. Oh, have you uh, really? Yeah, we oh, went in the, I'll have to send you the photos. Um, We went during the fall and the fall colors were absolutely phenomenal. And they've got a beautiful lake and campgrounds. Oh, and That's right. Uh, that's right. Oh, my gosh. Wow. So if you only I'd known. Do you want to sideline real quick? Why do they call it Fury Stone Park? Do you know about I the I do Fury? know. I do. Uh, it's the rocks. The rocks, actually, it's kind of like a geology thing. And yes. um, they actually morph into what looks like little fairies. The stones themselves are like little fairies. And then they have all this mythology connected to it. But it really is geology versus mythology. Well, you know, I it's like little it. stories. I still have six of those little fairy stones. I still have Please. those from visited when I was five years old. Yes. Wow. <laughs> I still have those. <laughs> wow. Wow. They've been, been my guardian angels all these years. Who knows? Well, and they are, you know, fairy stone is not far from um, the, the New River Gorge, which is one of our newest uh, national park units. Oh. And um, fall in that area is, I mean, you want to get on a horse and ride through the fall colors, which are just intense. I mean, where you are in Sequoia National Park area, you get those fall colors too, um, especially Three Rivers. So, but it's, you know, there's something about being on a horse and there's a show jumping and everything, but there's something about being out on the trail that I feel like there's this extra connection to nature because you're, there's a freedom to it while you still have to be very focused, very observant, I'm very in tune with your horse, which you're, you're, you know, the best at that of getting people to understand their horse and understanding how to have that mutual two way communication. Right. Um, yeah. Well, that's true know. about what you're saying about seeing the, the, the countryside on a horse. We have a saying we meaning, I think I read it somewhere, but I've sort of coined it myself as well. You can go and get into a car and go see what man has made, but you have to be on the back of a horse to see what God has made. And there's some beautiful country you will never see any other way unless you're sitting on the back of a horse. That's, That's true because even hiking when you're a horse, you're up, you know, it's, yeah. um, yes. yeah. That, that's, that's a beautiful thing. So that got you started on, on, you know, in the world of the, I call it the equestrian arts. I don't know if that's a term, but it is today. Um, and, and that uses an E and an A. So the ABCs, um, of horses, you know, this, this show is going every episode we're going to dig into one letter of the alphabet and um, look at, you know, topics connected with that. You know, Christy, I know you do so much work with beginners. I know that you work with trained special, you know, people that are in your teams that are also champions. Um, But I know that there's something for you to really um, work with a beginner. So when someone says, Hey, I want to ride, learn how to ride. Do you kind of, suss them out <laughs> that sounds terrible but is is there um do you have to well, kind of teach people how to be around a horse to begin with you know if you've never been around horses do you work with people that have never been around but love horses and want to learn how to ride but um may not even know how to groom you know i, I think you and i've talked about how growing up um i had uh, cinnabar my horse and nancy had certes they were both rescues we did do some training learn went you know did some showing as well um mm-hmm. we, we were more trail riders and you know kind of show jumping or but we we did have fun doing that i thought i wanted to go to the olympics but that no <laughs> that didn't quite work for me but mm-hmm. but there was a slow process before I was allowed to ride i had to learn how to groom i had to learn oh you know how much tack i had to clean before i was allowed to do anything oh, good. good glad to hear that yeah 
Yeah, so my program is very similar in a way that uh, if somebody wants to come here and, and learn to ride a horse, they're not going to show up and the horse is not going to be saddled. And we just plop them on the horse and sit, take them out to the arena and say, this is how you make them go and steer and all this. And you need to spend time with a horse to get to know it. Because if once you can, you need to develop harmony and a partnership. And the best way that's going to happen is by observation and seriously having patience to spend time to learn that horse's body language and his language. And then we give him time to learn ours as well. So my mm. students, whether you're seven years old or 70 years old, everyone is going to learn how to walk into the paddock, put the halter on the horse and lead it from the paddock over to the hitching rail, learn how to tie a horse correctly for mm. safety and security. And they'll learn how to groom because grooming is also just a real great way to, to develop that partnership with a horse. And then you, it's a way of checking yours to make sure they've been they're safe. Everything went fine last night in the middle of the night. They don't have any cuts or scratches or they didn't lose a shoe. And you observe how they are handling the, the grooming, sort of like a horsey massage, and you're developing a partnership mm-hmm. and a communication. Yeah. I remember having, you know, I remember going step by step and it's like, okay, I'm going to do the main. But then I remember just even having to, you know, brush the rump, basically. You know, you got to be careful of the butt ski and you don't want to stand directly behind and you have to learn about how a horse will kick. There it is. K for kicking. Um, <laughs> so you had to learn and you learn not to, to startle a horse either because every think. horse has a personality and, you know, grooming will teach you that i think more than anything right it's not it's not, it's not as it, on top of that it's not just the personality but the, you need to know why a horse reacts the way they do you have to understand why a horse even kicks so yes there's a safety zone if you don't know the horse but you have to understand why and actually it's the way that they are they are put together their eyes are mm-hmm. on the side of their head so they have peripheral vision they can see 360 degrees around their bodies but the problem with that is they don't see clearly. So they mm-hmm. react before they analyze, and they really are not very good at comprehending anyway. Their their instinct is to run from danger. So if they hear it or see it, any movement, any quickness, a certain sound that's not familiar, then they have the, the flight instinct of running from danger. But you need to learn that about horses. People don't only stop and think, gee, they don't have eyes like you and me that look straight mm-hmm. ahead. We have tunnel vision. Horses can have eyes on the side of their head. Mm. See so much more, and and also learning how to clean tack. I know this is where I, <laughs> I I think cleaning stables was my first duty, and I said duty for a reason. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's doing that. You learned, you know, that it's like when you get a puppy at home. Yes. You know, how many times do the parents end up doing all the duty work and the feeding mm-hmm. and the you know the watering? Um, mm-hmm. but it was like, if you don't get used to this and getting dirty, um, I, I love the smell of horse pee. Uh, you know, honestly, it is like a friend to me. Whenever I smell, I can smell the difference between horse and cow and, but well, let's take, I, I mean, let's take this a step further. Let's take this a step further. I'm glad you're bringing that up because <laughs> uh, is this pee for pee. <laughs> yeah. But I make, but I make my students also observe, and, and you know, when little children come for the very first time, adults won't do this, but the kids will go, "Oh, they're peeing! Oh, they're pooping!" And I say, "You know what? That poop, make, poop makes the greatest compost and grows your tomatoes and your flowers and everything else." But the important thing is to look at that poop, even to look at the pee, because that tells you how healthy your horse is. So you have to learn to be observant around horses. So when we do uh, horse camps here. They learn how to go to the haystack and see the good hay. Also to observe, gee, maybe there's some bad hay there that got rained on during the winter. We don't feed that to our horses. Always make sure, observe what you're feeding, and then look at what comes out the other end. That tells you just how healthy your horse is. Your horse will tell you there may be problems because of what is left behind, either in the poop or in the pee. So it's great that you observe that. The color makes a difference. It does. And, you know, it's really a bodily function. We all do it. And humans have to look at their pee, too. So, you know, pee, pee, pee all the way home. But it's, it's, I love that this we're starting off this whole show talking about pee and poo. I, I think now I'm really happy and excited about it. But, but you know, you bring up the hay thing is a really big deal because, and even nutrition. I actually, you know, you and I were talking about, you know, the show, you know, about a week ago. And, um, I, you know, 
I have, like, I, I was up, you know, my brain goes crazy with things, especially when you're really interested, like mm-hmm. horses. I, I mean, I've never stopped being the little girl with the horse, you know, mm-hmm. other than I've really grown. My waist mm-hmm. is not the same for sure. <laughs> all of that. But I, you know, there was so many, um, myths and truths right? It's like old wives tales of horses. And Mm -hmm. I I learned something when we were taking care of Luke the donkey in Arkansas. Oh, I love Luke. And we she was like the the, you know, pet parent there the donkey parent. Uh, Mm -hmm. She's a really sweet lady. She was like, you can give him a little bit of carrot, you can give him a little bit of apple. If you do too much, that's going to actually go into like, it's too much sugar for their digestion. And I'm like, okay, well, were we feeding our horses too much apple and carrots? Is that the same for a donkey versus a horse? Then I'm starting to go down a rabbit hole because I was mm-hmm. thinking that how many people just always, like at a resort or something that have horses or you, and one thing I've learned, you may see a horse on the side of, you know, go say hi to a horse on the side of the road or something, or maybe, you know, in the neighboring field. That doesn't mean you just start feeding that horse. You should never, ever feed someone else's horse. I'm just saying. If yes. you did that to mine, I'd come after you. And oh, I didn't have a good. shotgun, but I would if I could. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. But isn't I that right? Feed. You don't just do that. Yeah. You don't just no. feed. No, no. You know, in the occasional carrot or an apple in your pocket and you're walking down the road and there's a horse there, if you want to gamble to put in your hand out and trying to feed a horse, you don't know if he's going to bite you or not, which is for the first caution you should pay attention to. But one carrot and one apple won't hurt a horse. But buckets of them, yes. You know, yeah, because I wonder that. about how people just keep feeding, you know, how, what's the level of that? Like a donkey is yeah. a little bit different, you know, well, and the age and each animal's yeah. different. Right. You know? But people don't also pay attention to, to, hey, it can be damaged. Uh, it doesn't smell right. There could be something wrong. It could be a dead animal and who knows what got bailed that summer and, mm-hmm. in, in, you know, in the hay field. So you need to observe what you're feeding. Uh, we actually have a horse here on the ranch that's sugar intolerant, and that's another story in itself, how we found that out. But that I have to have my hay tested every year to make sure it has 10% or less sugar content. Wow. Horse, you know, put that horse, it'll tip her over the scales to the uh, condition that she has. So it's all manageable, but you have to manage it by feed and being cautious and knowing what you're feeding. You know, when we um, had the horses, we, we were stabling a friend's horse, Med Club Med. He was a retired uh, thoroughbred racehorse. Beautiful chestnut. Oh my God, just beautiful. But he was retired early, um, and it was because he was allergic to sand. His his hoofs were crumbling. He was allergic to hay. He was allergic to half the food. And eventually, we had to say goodbye and put him down, which was a hard, hard, hard thing to to be there for. But um. It was real, and and this is way back in the 80s when we don't have DNA and all these things now that we have that the tools we have now uh, for health of horses is just incredible. It's like diagnostics for your car, like plug it in, you know, but, um, but it is true. Like you say, a sugar intolerant horse, you know, if you just go and feed someone's, you know, too many apples or something that could really spike the sugar, right? For, for a sugar intolerant horse. So this, so we're going to be getting into all of these. We've got nutrition. We're going to be covering, we're going to talk about breeds. We're going to talk about riding do's and don'ts. And, um, you know, it's, I'm excited about this because when we go through the, the alphabet, it just, like I was saying, the rabbit hole of this, yeah, uh, you could go <laughs> on forever. But yes. how much of this do you think is going to really go into the psychology and connection between the human and the animal? I think it's going to be, I think we're going to get into a lot of that, um, so. of the communication. I hope, I hope our listeners will, will pay attention to it. And matter of fact, I'm working on a fourth book that is going to be similar to the ABCs of, of, for people being able to learn more about horses before they really even get into it. It just gives them a, a step up in preparing mm. for maybe the first lesson and the first ride and and just a little more knowledge than um, showing up in shorts and flip-flops and saying they want to ride a horse. So we, you know, we're going to help them. We're going to help them understand what to look for. There's certain traits also in people, especially children that are developing of whether or not they're going to be focused enough and interested in this. And um, there'll be some tips in that book for the adults as well, but we just, we're going to help people along the way. Let's get them more educated. 
Yeah, you know, there's so much to purchasing a horse as well. And so tell us a bit about that of when someone is now going to purchase a horse. Do you look at the health of the horse? Because I know you even do it with photos and videos and people work with you online as a consultant uh, for all kinds of things, uh, equine, equine, equine related. Equine, um, equine. Yeah, yeah equine. the equine. Um, so you do a lot of that. But when you look at a horse and help people, you know, when they're ready to purchase a horse, and we should talk about money, you know, horses do cost a lot of money. <laughs> so I'm just going to say that at the yeah. end of the day. Be prepared to have a budget for this because, you know, vet bills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, well, we'll talk about that a little bit about that in the future too, about what we, what you're going to get for your money. We'll talk yeah. about that for sure. But uh, I'm helping people, uh, uh, basically usually send me videos of the horse, uh, tracking or moving so we can check for soundness. Soundness is a health, obviously the one of the biggest health issues. We want a horse that's not lame, that doesn't limp. Um, and so I can evaluate that with a, a video. Uh, it's important. Uh, I call it form to function. If you have a horse with correct conformation, meaning correct bone structure, he's going to travel better. Uh, if his bones are straighter and his hooves are at the correct angle, this horse will last you a lifetime, no matter what you want to do, whether it's show jumping or trail riding. Um, but when you start having flaws and imperfections, then that's where the weakness will be. My best example is trying to drive a big one-ton um, Chevrolet truck and you put little Toyota tires on it. Well, guess what's going to happen to the alignment? It's going to yeah. go well, though. You're going to have some blowouts because it can't sustain the weight. And that happens with conformation in horses. You know, they may have a big, beautiful body, but is the hoof big enough to carry that weight? And, and the bone structure is so important for them to function um, in every aspect of, of horse life. And then what about the the temperament of the human and the horse right Does we call that it come into play disposition is very important in a horse and there's breeds we'll talk about that later on too that there are different breeds that are a little more high strung and uh, a little more um, on the muscle and, and ready to go there are some breeds that are a little quieter but a lot of that also um, has to do with training what type of training what type of riding you're going to do some people want their horses excited, so they perform quicker for that particular discipline. Um, so a disposition is really important. Uh, a horse that's uh, agreeable to be trained, that's a good disposition. You just cer- certainly don't want to battle with the horse. And there's many out there that are very, very stubborn, which mm. makes it difficult. Gives you, and it's going to take more time to, to get through to them. Um, so disposition. Well, I was going to say, you, you, you've got D for dis- disposition. <laughs> We better start writing this down so we cover it. But that's, I, I love that you always look at that connection because I think that's what makes um, something, a, a relationship successful because the horse has to be happy and well cared for and, and loved. You know, well, that's something. Okay. Let's flip that coin really quick. And let's just, so we're still on, since we're still on that topic, let's flip the coin now and talk about the human. So if the human Uh-oh. is a really, okay, here we go. If the human is a really nervous person, constantly bite, biting their fingernails, a chain smoker, and just can't stand still, that's when we're talking more now about an adult. Even with a child that isn't disciplined enough in school to sit down and listen to a teacher, trying to learn something, um, you know, listening to an instructor, there's certain traits that you look for because you don't want to have a big, high-strung, nervous horse with a child or an adult that's high-strung and nervous. It's not going to be a good combination. Mm. That's a smart. And the smoking thing, I think I told you I was in a town recently at an event, and they had a horse and carriage, and the person running the carriage was smoking right in the horse's face. And the horse is trying to move away, and he kept moving the horse's face back you know, to keep them all pristine and, and in alignment, but he's smoking in the horse's face. And I, I it took everything in me not to go up and <laughs> you know reprimand. Every, every living, breathing thing wants to breathe clean air. Hmm. So a horse is the same way. That's a, that's a, a not very courteous of that person to do that. And, um, and also it's, you know, that's a hazard actually. Uh, you know, you can do what you want to on your own time. But where there's no smoking on this ranch because there's hay piled here and there, and there's some wood structures, and my gosh, there's horses' manes and tails, and 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 grooming that you're going to do near a horse, so you're certainly not going to have a cigarette hanging out of your mouth. Absolutely not. 
but those those are just things that you um, have to take into consideration your own habits, your own focus, your own mm-hmm. line of patience. I mean, you can say a prayer every morning, Lord, give me patience, but I want it now. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to slow it down just a little because the horse will mirror what you are. Mm-hmm. So if you show up and you're nervous that day and you just had a fight with your husband, your boyfriend, or your boss, you re- even though horses are great therapy, if you're calm enough and they're calm enough, you can they'll actually bring you down and, and center, center you a little bit more. But you also have to leave that at the door or in your car or wherever that's going to be because if you're going to be that uptight and mad and nervous and everything else, then your horse is going to feel that and he's not going to be happy and he's going to be worried. You don't want a horse mm-hmm. worried. You want a horse very really relaxed to do his job and to take care of you and to be a partner that day. You can't be a partner if you're battling, right? Yeah, that's but, right. Yeah. And you don't want to be like that in front of kids. You don't even want animals, dogs pick it up too. Right. Um, whenever you, and if you have that nervous, like, if you're nervous, like, oh, we need to do N for nerves because even going, when you go into like a, a show and you're nervous, mm-hmm. you know, you've got the butterflies. We all get that. Like as a musician, you get the butterflies before you go on stage. And if you don't have that little bit of a butterfly, then it's, I think it's a good thing, a little bit of that. But if you are a basket of nerves and your horse picks up on it, you probably won't do as well. You know what I mean? And I always feel like that's when your safety is at risk is when you start getting into a bundle of nerves. I know it from driving and I drive every day darn terrain on this country (laughs) the roads in this country from ice to you know it and if i start getting really scared then you know you're not um entirely focused you know so so this is what i tell my students especially the students that go into the show arena and they're competing at higher levels it's okay to have butterflies your butterflies are going to get you alert they're going to get you paying attention you know things are going to be happening it's okay to have butterflies as long as you make them fly in formation. That's my answer. Ah, oh, that is good. You're so good, Christy. <laughs> B is for butterflies and horses. Oh, that's beautiful, isn't it? Horses yeah. and butterflies together. Yeah. So um, you train in English and Western disciplines. So can you give us a, just an overview of the difference between the two? I've written both ways. It took a very, it was very weird to go Western after oh, being yeah. up, down, up, down on the trot. Oh, you know? wow. okay. Yes. Okay. Well, the English saddle, the English saddle was uh, developed for uh, fox hunting. Originally, that's what it was for. It was a more forward seat uh, that was more forward on the horse's withers to get the weight of the rider off of their back. Because when you go fox hunting, you have to jump over hedges and follow the hounds. And you can't do that if everybody knows what a Western saddle looks like. You've got a horn sticking up, and that's going to end up in your gut oh. if you can jump a horse. So the, the English saddle was designed uh, mainly for fox hunting. We call that uh, hunter under saddle riding, which is uh, a beautiful, long, flowing stride of a horse that's not going to take the fences but can cover some ground. So the English saddle is used for that. But there's another type of English saddle, which is called a flat saddle, which is brought in then to the style of riding, which is called saddle seat. And that's more like plantation riding, uh, where mm. the saddle beds, the Tennessee walkers use that type of saddle. So there's two styles of English riding. Uh, and the stirrups are different. Uh, the iron, they're actually called irons. And the leathers are a little different. And it's uh, there's not really a lot to those saddles. It just sort of wraps around the horse's uh, conformation a little uh, tighter than it would a Western saddle. But that Western saddle is designed to work a ranch and to settle the West. I mean, they're going to rope those steers and dally that rope around the saddle horn and drag it to the, to the mm-hmm. uh, pit where they're going to go ahead and brand the cattle and let them then roam. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it serves its purpose as well. Uh, each saddle serves the purpose of what you're going to do. I remember um, as part of my training of having to ride bareback, which I actually preferred in a way I felt more connected. It's and. I'm like, you know, as, as a musician, I actually prefer, prefer being barefoot on stage because there's just an energy feel and I feel more grounded. Sounds weird, but that's who I am. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really don't care and I don't want to have to wear shoes and especially high heels. I'm going down. <laughs> there's no high heels happening with me. I know it's unladylike and I really don't care, but, yeah. um, 
with bareback, um, you, you were talking about how that's where, you know, you were riding bareback before you could afford a saddle. Do you feel like that gave you, um, you know, helped you towards winning that first show too, is understanding that balance. And I think you understand the anatomy of a horse better too, when you're, I don't know, you just have, you, you build your upper like leg, your upper thigh and butt, mm-hmm. your butt ski in a way. That, you're, um, you're poor as well. <clears throat> yes, you're yeah. going to develop your balance. You're going to develop your balance because your life, life depends on it. You haven't got a saddle horn to grab or your irons to put your, or stirrups to put your feet in. So riding bareback, it really, it almost uh, pushes you quicker to get in tune with your horse because you really haven't got anything else to rely on except mm. to strengthen your legs, your core muscles, and knowing how your horse is going to move. So yes, when you're bareback, you're going to feel their thoughts being applied to how they're going to move, and you can sense that and feel that because there's no saddle in play. Yes, but I don't start people out riding bareback. Everybody's just going to fall off because they haven't got that skill and they haven't developed the sense yet of how to guide and how to partner with the horse. And so I, I prefer to start people in at Western Saddle just to help them have a little more security and so they can relax and then they get in tune a little better. And then uh, we actually finish off lessons with some bareback riding. Uh, oh, that's cool. Yes. yes. Wow. Okay, so now, all right. Well, what I wanted to go on this, um, did, mostly the Native Americans were bareback, weren't they? Or did they, I mean, what happened yes, in the saddles? Were. No, they were. In the beginning, they were. Okay. I know we're going to talk a lot about that in the next episode, talking about the Appaloosa horse, Chief Joseph and the Nez Perce, and, and also your third book, which is out now. Um, we're going to be talking about hoof, hoof prints across time, a trail ride to remember. We'll get in depth with that. I think we've been doing good on show jumping and don't forget Ranger, the little horse with a big heart. That's also another book out uh, by Christy. But um, I also just wanted to touch on these court cases being a legal witness. I mean, are, what well, I mean, what, listen, what just, kind of cases are these? What, I mean, are you looking? Did the horse? Did the horse take drugs or what? what? Okay, so really, it's called an expert witness because I don't want to use the word legal. I'm not legally trained as an attorney or in, in the law mm-hmm. office realm. I'm I'm used as an expert witness because of my experience uh, of dealing with horses in every aspect of just about life of, with horses. So I was called, I've been called in before, usually when people are a little more uh, relaxed um, or careless about what they do around a horse and somebody gets hurt. So, you know, there is a protocol and really what you should do around horses. And if people are going to get uh, that relaxed and someone gets hurt, then that's when they end up in court sort of suing each other for medical bills or whatever the reason is. And there's there's a logical approach to everything that you do with the horse. And that's what my beginning lessons are going to be about. And that's a lot about what this ABC is of horses are going to be about and about my fourth book's going to be about that as well. So, you know, there's if you try to sh- cut the corners, you sort of get what you pay for. Hmm. Hate this yeah. You know, I, 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 Dealing with a 1,200-pound animal, you're not going to be careless. You shouldn't be careless, and you don't want to cut corners. You need to have a pattern. You need to have a program, and you need to keep everybody safe so they can have fun. I love that about you, that you don't cut corners, because I think that's a rule for life and in, in business. And I loved it. Um, we did that Q&A with you, the Success Insider, um, as an equestrian expert, and you know, talking about that philosophy of how horses actually better your life um teach you discipline teach you patience Mm -hmm. teach you these life skills that will not only improve your personal world but also your professional life so um i'm going to make sure that's linked in the show notes everybody and also christy's website will be in there and um we can't wait uh we're going to be here every second saturday on bigblendradio.com you'll be able to hear christy talk about this so next uh episode will be when we dig into the alphabet so get your alphabet soup out and your animal crackers and let's giddy up <laughs> all right it sounds wonderful nancy i think this is a great idea i'm excited and i hope i hear from everybody i hope people will contact me and yes. uh, you know, there's no such thing as a dumb question just ask That's away right you want to know and let's let's get more knowledge out there let's help each other exactly exactly thank you all for joining us thank you christy we'll talk again soon have a great day thank you 
Thank you for listening to Big Blend Radio's ABCs of Horses featuring Christy Wood. You can keep up with Christy and learn more about her services and her books by going to her website, wdnhorse.com. Keep up with Big Blend Radio at bigblendradio.com.